So I used to work in solid state physics before coming to Amazon. And uh, to my delight, I just uh, met one of your scientists here who uh, at the time used uh, some of the solid state physics software that I, I authored uh, during my, uh, my academic years. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that you noticed at the time I spent a lot of time helping out uh, early users of the code, answering questions on the mailing list, how do you install this HPC code for physics, how do you get it to work? It was fairly typical that a lot of the time you spent on this mailing list, a lot of time you spent as the owner of an HPC code, you spent just getting people off the ground, just getting people started with your application. And that's why I got interested in cloud back in those very early days. I thought, well, if I just ship them a virtual machine instead of the source code, a lot of these problems are going to go away. And I can make it easier for them to get started, especially because I've always been interested in writing applications that aren't just for theory papers, but that are actually being used by hundreds of thousands of experimentalists who are working in a lab and you know, waiting for theory results to uh, make more sense of their, uh, of their measurements. And um, I did a bit of cloud computing early in the days when you could still publish a paper and saying, hey, I did exactly the same as you, but it ran on the cloud. Look at that. And uh, that would get published. That's, of course, no longer true today. You missed your chance. Uh, but I got a few of those publications out. And then Amazon took notice, and uh, about four and a half years ago, they uh, asked me to come join a team focused on scientific computing. And uh, that was <coughs> how I wanted to stay there and not go to some prestigious national lab in the middle of nowhere. So I took the offer and uh, went to Amazon. I mostly work with uh, universities and uh, national labs these days, uh, doing a lot of high-performance computing, but uh, also research computing uh, more broadly. Um, I want to open the talk with um, maybe 15 or 20 minutes about uh, what's the most successful research I've seen in the cloud and, and what are the <coughs> principles around which to orient your uh, research in the cloud. Equivalently, why do I think cloud is there to stay and still grow significantly within research? Right? I'm sure you all have the campus resources, you have your national computing centers. Cloud is sort of the, the new addition to that portfolio. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be there for the long term. This is why. If you think about who came to the cloud first, it was uh, startup businesses that have now grown into the you know, Netflixes and Airbnbs of the world, right? Uh, they came to the cloud because they had to move fast. They had to be agile, right? They wanted uh, as little time as possible spent on the mechanical work of managing servers. And they also wanted to know that the platform that they were building on could grow. If their business grew by a factor of 10, then the platform just had to be able to handle that. Uh, what they call agility actually translates pretty directly to what you call time to discovery in, in every grant application that you or your supervisors write. You would also benefit from being able, to, being able to test out new ideas and prove or disprove them more quickly. You probably want your papers to get out more quickly. The students among you probably wouldn't mind graduating a little more quickly. Uh, well, the cloud can help you with all of that in a few ways by making resources available to you precisely when you want them, the right type and the right quantity allowing you to build out new ideas faster. And uh, let's look at a few, a few examples of that. Oh, and actually, I have a fancy clip. Let's go there. All right. Uh, I didn't put this thing in, uh, in my deck to flatter you. I, we actually uh, have seen some Australian HPC science use cases that we're proud of and that we do show all around the world. Uh, the koala genetics study is one of them. So it's uh, really a conservation effort where um, samples were taken from thousands of these cute little animals all had to be analyzed to study the diversity of the population and what have you. Um, if you have a certain number of computers to do that at home, but you could temporarily rent 10 times as many computers in the cloud, you get the work done 10 times faster. The application goes out, the policymakers and the conservationists can get the work, et cetera. So that's fairly sorry, short, a fairly straightforward uh, principle. There are uh, there are many similar use cases. For example, there's tons of work happening around satellite imagery these days, uh, both in research as well as in uh, commercial enterprises. This is an example where NASA wanted to run a certain study all across the Sahara Desert. Uh, you just take all the satellite imagery, you pile it up into thousands of little pieces, and you can scale it out horizontally to basically as many compute cores as you can find. This is another case where if they'd had it fitted into their on-premise HPC clusters, it would have taken them about 10 months, because of course there's many other things that need to happen on those HPC clusters. By uh, separating it out and bringing it to the cloud, the work was done in a month instead. Uh, there's 
many times I think when research, when it would make a big difference if you got your work done nine times faster and you could move on to the next iteration of your drug or your semiconductor or, or whatever you're, uh, you're designing in the lab. Uh, at the high end of the scale, we now have people that come to AWS and spin up uh, half a million core compute fleets for the weekend. <coughs> you can take that literally. Uh, this is a, a use case from a university doing a machine learning and natural language processing workload on us uh, <coughs> a few years ago. We have a more recently where Western Digital, you know, the company that makes the hard drives that are in your computer, uh, had a large number of semiconductor candidates they wanted to study. Uh, they came to Amazon, they used a, a Univ uh, scheduler, spun up a, a single cluster of 20 or 30,000 servers, about 650,000 compute cores. Had that running for three days and shut the whole thing down again, took the, the results, the data files that were the result of that, of that back home. Uh, now this is, you want the scale of most of the work that happens at a, at a university or a national lab. <laughs> but it is interesting because this is really, it's the same scale as a large national computing facility, right? There is that much capacity available on the commercial cloud on Amazon today. Uh, the other interesting thing about this, my pointer seems to have died, but I'll use my finger. Um, what is this? Think of this as Amazon's total capacity in servers over time. And the <coughs> colored bars are various types of customers that are using that. And this squiggly line here is just our buffer. But you always want to look infinity, like there's always more capacity. So obviously we have a, a spare capacity buffer of extra servers and extra cores. And we sell those at a discount as preemptible machines. So you can get them at typically 80% off the list price, which is great for, for research where the budgets are, are usually, usually fixed and limited, uh, but they can be taken away if a full price customer needs them. <laughs> These people with the half million uh, compute core fleets are running in our spare capacity buffer in a single AWS region. So that's how big the cloud has gotten. So when we say resources are there, we need them. You can you can uh, you can take us up on that on that claim. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, you're welcome to interrupt with questions anytime. Uh, I'm not married to the slides, so you can derail the presentation if uh, if you would like. Uh, beyond just a lot of course, it can also be a matter of uh, what type of uh, servers do you want. Maybe you have one or two types of servers on the campus, and there's really a third or a fourth type that you would like to have for your research. For example, people in uh, computer science love to play with FPGAs, which is a, a new kind of accelerator. Uh, you've added as a special kind of GPU, if you've, if you've never heard of it before. Uh, not many places have that, but you just come in and rent them by the hour. The use case you see here is a, a, a genomics lab that set a, a world record a year and a half ago for the fastest uh, human genome processing uh, at, at that time. Right. Uh, now, apart from just having a lot of compute capacity available, there is also more to be had on the cloud than just servers that you log into and, and configure. Uh, we also offer managed layers on top of those servers. For example, if you like working with, <coughs> with containers, if you have Docker containers that, that you use for your research, then you can just come to Amazon and say, run my container. You don't have to go and start a Linux box and install the Docker agent and, and all that, right? We have managed services that do this for you, right? Uh, similarly, I show a few examples here on the screen. We have a, a managed machine learning service where you can just work in a Jupyter notebook just the same way that you would do on your laptop. But when it comes to running a really big training job, which you probably need if you want to build a, a publishable machine learning model, you probably need a big training job. And from that notebook, you can just call in the power of the cloud. And you can say, Amazon, you now need to run this training job on 256 GPUs. And the service will know how to virtualize that, go away, go do it in the background, and give you the trained model back. But you don't have to learn how to become a Linux, uh, Linux cluster administrator. So this is a, a service that's proving uh, very popular with researchers and students. And we go all over the place uh, doing workshops for this and letting students uh, try it out. And, uh, I know that uh, my colleague uh, would probably be happy to, uh, have to sit one of those up for you for your campus if, uh, if you'd like. Um, at the bottom here is uh, our managed uh, compute service. So what do you see a lot of people do? 
say you have a, you have your genomics lab again. I'll, I'll stick with that example, right? And you have an instrument. You're taking samples and measuring them. Some sort of data file comes out of your instrument. Let's say you upload all of those files to Amazon Storage. We call the basic storage Amazon S3, and we think of it as buckets. You drop your, your files in, in the bucket. You can have trigger actions defined on that bucket, where every time a file of a certain <laughs> type comes in, it will look at the file, transform it, and define a corresponding analytics job. It will put that job in a managed job queue. That job queue will know to go find compute capacity to do the processing. And while you're off having lunch somewhere, the output gets computed and put in another storage service or fed into another analytics service that's part of the pipeline. And so you can build these automated systems where all you're doing is you're throwing data files over the fence or you land in an Amazon storage location and everything else happens automatically from there. People can set these things up in, in hours or days or weeks, depending on, uh, on how familiar you are with, uh, with, with how it works. And the nice thing is, is that every piece of this pipeline has the robustness of the Amazon platform. So, you know, if you start by doing one sample at a time, and now next week you actually want to process 100 samples in one go, that's fine. All these pieces can scale as needed to handle the extra demand that you place in them. That's not something that you have to manage or worry about. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just great if your idea takes off and, uh, and you need to scale it up. Um, we've had some success with these things in Australia. Some of you may have heard of this case where uh, it's a CSIRO project. Um, the concept here was that um, samples, uh, human uh, DNA samples, would come in at an unpredictable uh, rate or with an unpredictable pattern. Um, but the results were always needed sort of interactively within a few minutes. It's very difficult to have a system that will vary in compute capacity, in processing capacity, and that can still respond within a few minutes. Uh, they achieved it by pulling their traditional app apart, redefining it in terms of serverless computing, and serverless computing is basically source code that gets executed on managed EC2 servers that we already have. Uh, they're standing by warm and waiting for action, right? <laughs> so it can scale from zero to hundreds or even thousands of compute cores within a second. But you never also never have idle capacity uh, that you have to provision in that year that is costing you money. Another example of that, this is a, a customer I work with personally. It's a, a startup in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, they're there because they hire away climate scientists from one of the government agencies there that uh, studies the weather and the climate. And uh, the business they're in is uh, like long-term climate change impact studies for customers. So this is an example where they calculated, you probably can't see this, there's a slider here going out to 2030. They're calculating the long-term flood risk for one of their customers at a particular site using weather and climate models and uh, satellite data and weather observation data and what have you. Uh, again, they could do that just by getting a bunch of Linux servers from Amazon and configuring everything themselves. But because it's a startup, they're you know, lean and mean and want to work fast and, and be very efficient. Uh, they use all these building blocks that we described before. Scientists just generate storm scenarios. So these are like text input files basically, right? That you would feed into an HPC application. They put them into an Amazon storage location. That gets processed. It somehow knows how to define jobs, pull in container images, and run this on automatically scaling fleets of compute servers that handle all the, uh, all the number crunching, that solve the differential equations, and uh, store the output somewhere where they can uh, process it further or deliver it to their, to their customers. The nice part was, you know, no sooner had the, 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 the software architects built this, for this startup. Then their scientists said, uh, yeah, that's interesting. It would be great if you could do this 5,000 times so we can calculate error bars on our, uh, on our model, right? Uh, and that was relatively <laughs> trivial because they used all these individually scalable uh, building blocks. It wasn't really a lot of work to now do it 5,000 times. And look, I, I worked in science for a good number of years. Uh, all scientists are like that, right? They come back and they say, can you now do it 5,000 times? Uh, okay. So, uh, your time to discovery can become shorter because resources are available when you want them, up to very large numbers. You have a large variety of server types that you probably couldn't all offer on premise. And there are lots of advanced building blocks beyond just basic storage and compute. 
with all these advanced building blocks, you can build really robust, interesting modern applications and provide your, your ideas faster. Um, that, by the way, is also where we differ from national compute facilities. So national compute facilities, like what's it called, the NCI, I think, um, they're, they're pretty good at offering compute and at offering <laughs> storage. But you can't really expect them to build out like, you know, 200 of other types of services for every type of workload in the world. Uh, the way that the way that Amazon does, or at least I haven't seen anything like that happen anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, the second reason why I think cloud is is good for science and is going to be is going to be now for, for uh, the long term is uh, collaboration. So you all know science is collaborative, and you've all heard people give talks about big data for at least ten years. Maybe 10 years. Um, it's finally actually happening, right? Uh, data is coalescing into large data lakes. People are starting to do interdisciplinary learning across data sets that were generated in different fields. Um, and data really is becoming too heavy uh, to move, right? Uh, lots of places now wish they could, you know, I'll talk about like climate science, which I follow the most closely. Uh, lots of people want CMIP data, it's sort of the most uh, commonly used uh, set of uh, long term climate scenarios. Uh, CMIP 4 was. Um, couple tens of terabytes, you can fit it on a few hard disks. CMIP 5 is uh, around a petabyte or so. It gets a little harder to move, move around or to download over uh, your average institutional internet connection. CMIP 6 is being generated right now will be somewhere between 12 and 20 petabytes, right? We don't know yet how big CMIP 7 will be, but probably bigger than that again. So um, you need platforms that are good at hosting vast amounts of data that allow you to work across the data, that provide you ways to do so securely and that provide as much uh, analytics and compute capability around it as possible. Because in the end, data itself is useless. It's only the, the inside sort of decisions that you draw from the data that, that ultimately uh, bring value, right? Um, so what's great about being on the cloud? So uh, again, this here, the bucket is Amazon S3. It's our most general storage platform. Once you put your data in here, uh, what happens? Well, the data is right around the corner from all these other services that Amazon is building out. So if you want to do machine learning on that data, or if you just make that data accessible and somebody else that you don't even know wants to do machine learning on your data, they can do that. We have the EC2, which is Linux server capability for them. Go grab a few GPUs and start working on the data set. We also have a number of managed machine learning services. We have managed image recognition services. There are, you know, there's the SageMaker notebook-based service that we talked about before. All that stuff is here. Uh, we have managed SQL services, data analytics clusters, Spark clusters. All that stuff is, you know, is right here. So it's a lot easier to get results out of the data. The other thing that's interesting is you don't actually have to give anybody else any resources. Right? You upload the data. By default, it's always completely private to you. You're the only one that can see it. You will always remain the owner and maintain, maintain the full IP to that data, no question about that. Now, if you want your collaborator to look at that, all you have to do is give them read access to your data set. Okay. Now, if they need four hours to go and, and probe that data, that's between them and Amazon. You don't need to give them an allocation. You don't need to make logins and worry about security for them. You don't need to figure out how to back build them. That's between them and us. Right. You can make uh, collaboration a lot easier. Here's an example of uh, when it was done right. So next rad is uh, weather observation data, weather observation data. <coughs> it's put out by uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanographical and Atmospheric Research Agency, I think. I don't know why there isn't an R in there. Um, it's a data set of about 400 to 500 terabytes. And it's widely used both in academia and in enterprise. <laughs> what you see here, the bar graphs, it's the utilization of the, the number of downloads of that data uh, year by year. It stagnates here because the NOAA servers, the government servers that was on, were just maxed out. There just wasn't any more bandwidth to serve that data, right? Um, and I mean, that's fair to say it's not really NOAA's mission to be uh, you know, a, a world-leading data provider necessarily. Um, so in 2016, we put up a copy in AWS, and uh, the most noticeable thing is that the demand for the data suddenly jumped up, right? So there was apparently a lot of latent demand for the data. Uh, I'm sure all of you can think of a, a data set or two that maybe you've authored or that you know. 
that would benefit from this kind of jump in utilization, right? It would help science move forward faster. It wouldn't hurt your citation count. And it's also great because this data is all probably generated with uh, taxpayer dollars usually. So, you know, the more utility you get out of it, the better. Uh, you might also notice that uh, people seem to like getting it from the cloud more than from NOAA itself because the longer NOAA servers actually, actually dropped a bit, which NOAA was happy about because they could use that bandwidth that got freed up for, uh, for other reasons. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, we thought we were just sharing uh, weather data. But the next year, we saw a paper, uh, Nature Ecology, where the abstract started saying that NOAA and AWS made available one of the latest data sets describing animal movement ever compiled. It's the same data set, and we had no clue that it had anything to do with animal migrations. Um, but so here we go. And I love showing this slide because it, it never ceases to crack me up that there's graphs and units of millions of birds per kilometer. And, I don't know. I yeah, yeah, it is, but uh, I guess I'm used to like a Coulomb's first square angstrom or something like that, so uh, it's an unusual uh, unit for me. Um, this is becoming more common, I think, that you know, you think you're measuring soil ecology, but then some anthropologist comes along and can do something with the soil sample that you measured, and uh, all these things are becoming increasingly uh, uh, more common. Um, Genomics tends to be a little bit further along than the other science domains in terms of uh, cloud adoption. Um, you probably grumble and say that's because they get all the money. Uh, there may be some truth to that. I think it's also a field that carries maybe a somewhat less legacy than, say, physics or chemistry, which is, is, is more my background. And so they've been maybe a little more, um, been a little bit easier for them perhaps to, to invest in, uh, in newer platforms and, uh, and newer tools. So in the US, the National Institute for Health is putting tens of petabytes of cancer research data in a cloud commons. And uh, they're not only doing an FTP dump, but they also have money to build platforms and tools so that domain scientists can actually go and use that, right? Uh, just dumping the data files is one thing, but it helps if you have friendly interfaces and, and tools in, uh, in front of that. Uh, NASA is also bringing uh, massive amounts of data to the cloud. Um, the impetus for that was that NASA has a mission to educate the public, as I'm sure do many institutions here, right? Now, think about it. What would happen to NASA's website the day of a solar eclipse? It goes through the roof, right? Uh, and their servers aren't meant to handle that, of course. It would be really inefficient if NASA tried to build capacity for that one time a year. On the same, at the same time, they don't want to miss that one time a year. It's crucial to their mission. And if you think, if you have an entrepreneurial mind, it probably reminds you of the businesses that came to Amazon Web Services early on for the Black Friday sales, right? Again, that's just once a year. You don't want to have servers up for that year round, but you also don't want to miss that peak because that's the day that most businesses break out of the grid, right? You don't want to miss that. So it's the same here. So they just started hosting the data through Amazon, and now it's there, and now research can also start to get done on the data sets. Uh, tens of petabytes, and people are already uh, eagerly anticipating it and, and uh, building tools for it. New Met Office, same story in weather. Imagine there's a, a bad storm coming, the demand on their weather app, of course, goes through the roof. Uh, you know, it makes sense to use something like Amazon to, uh, uh, to deal with that peak in demand. Now, um, <laughs> those of you that were nodding off a little bit, um, wake up for a second. So we have a really interesting program called the, uh, the Public Dataset Program. Uh, we've taken about 100 data sets that we think are among the most interesting in their field. And we host those completely for free. So Amazon pays for the storage and the downloads against that data. The idea is that they serve as lighthouse examples. <coughs> and any researcher or student can go and, and work on these data sets. Um, a lot of them are in earth science. A lot of them are in life science and genomics. There's some, some other ones as well. And so uh, this is just a, um, a screenshot of the, the program's uh, uh, web page. Uh, you see some uh, satellite data here, obviously. Um, this is uh, space data. These are uh, mouse brains. Um, it's a little bit easier to make that public than human brains. Uh, that's why they're mouse brains. Uh, street maps, and this is uh, some atmospheric data sets, and I, I don't know what that is. Oh, thousand genomes. The um, uh, Queensland is on the last Excellent. So that's really hard. This program is uh, still open for new data sets, by the way. If you have a data set that you say, look, people are having difficulty accessing this data, but it's really valuable to a wide array of people across various fields, 
uh, come talk to us and make a case and maybe we'll add it to the program. And each of the data sets has a, you know, documentation in a certain format with uh, links and, uh, and examples and what have you. So I encourage everybody to go and uh, play around with this a bit. Or if you are a teacher, uh, just imagine that you could, you know, delete the hello world from your, uh, from your course and have your students learn data, data science on actual petabyte size uh, genomics data set. Wouldn't that be exciting? That's, uh, that's what I would like to see happen. Good. Um, usually what we see at universities or at HPC centers is nobody throws away all their own premise machinery on Tuesday and puts everything on the cloud on Wednesday. That's not usually how it goes. It usually is usually a migration that goes research project by research project project or group by group or, or something uh, along those lines. And uh, the people that are usually the first and the most motivated to check out the cloud are the ones that, for some reason, don't fit the on what's available on premise as well as everybody else. Uh, the first example is uh, I work with a lot of people that have just intermittent workloads, like they do wildfire modeling, but they live somewhere where you know the mantles are covered in snow seven months out of the year. It does, makes no sense to have three servers sitting in a closet to handle that. That's something that obviously you want to virtualize and put in the clouds. It's going to be much more efficient. The other thing is a, is a capacity buffer. So a lot of university HPC centers uh, try to be efficient, <coughs> cost efficient, by keeping their systems, their computers fully utilized or almost fully utilized all the time. So that really helps with driving the cost per core hour down. But of course, the trade-off is that people are only going to have to sit in a queue. Their jobs are going to have to sit in a queue. Uh, sometimes that's great, and then you may have times of the year where the queues get longer, and that's actually not so great, right? And so some places decide to say, at those times, we're going to take all that excess, right? We're going to take all that extra demand. We're going to do that on the cloud so that our researchers never have to, uh, you know, let's say that you're in some sort of feedback loop where you design something in the lab, then you need to do a simulation, then you need to on your design. If you add a week of queue time to each of those steps, your research project is really going to incur some heavy delays. Okay, let's take some of these cases in, in, and move them to the cloud. Something else we see commonly. Um, outliers. Almost everywhere we go, there are outliers, right? The, the campus cluster was uh, designed for an average HPC use case, but now suddenly you've got these pesky machine learners popping up everywhere in every field, and they just, uh, they're just hungry for GPUs, and there's no keeping up with them, right? Uh, well, you know, if you need more, you can, you can just come and uh, rent those from us by the hour. That can often be easier and, and more efficient than trying to provision a large amount of them uh, yourself. Genomics researchers are uh, enough, uh, another uh, typical example where, you know, the campus cluster has four gigabytes of memory per core or something, you know, which is great for a lot of HPC workloads. But these genomics people want four terabytes of RAM per server which a lot of places don't have because it's not that common. Well, you know, we have them. You can, you can come get them from us. We're going up to 24 terabytes per server this year. So if you need that for a given project or a given research group, it makes sense to take care of that in the cloud. Uh, finally, security. So uh, when I started with Amazon four years ago, I'd go give a talk and half the questions would be about security. Is the cloud safe? Can I put my data there? Right? Uh, these days, that's completely reversed. So people are taking their, their PHI, their personal health information workloads, and bringing that to the cloud first. Because there are now strict government rules for what you have to do to work with that data. And it's very difficult and expensive for a digital campus to go through those, those uh, compliance certification process. It's, it's the same reason that like a lot of small farms can't go organic or something like that, because it's just too much of a burden for them to go through the process. So we now see a lot of campuses that move that to the cloud first is a, a big change from how it used to be. Uh, so this slide can also serve as a, you know, a prompt for a thought exercise on your behalf. Um, I'm sure a lot of researchers are happy with what they uh, receive from you on premise, but are there people who would maybe benefit from the cloud environment? Are there cases that you think would, uh, would be a better fit in, in the cloud? This is sort of my list of, of what I commonly see. You may have others here. Okay, so we talked about time of discovery and collaboration. Uh, the next question is usually, well, okay, this sounds inter interesting, but uh, how do we start out? Or how do we try it out? We have a few different uh, resources for that. So first of all, in the 
level of an individual scientist, uh, we wrote a little handbook that we call the, uh, the manual, the researcher's handbook to the cloud. And it takes you step by step through how do you set up an account, how do you make it secure. Here are the basic services you should probably learn a little bit, a little bit about with links to tutorials that will feel relevant for a researcher. So this avoids you being lost on a general Amazon website, which has something like 170 services or so on it now. I, I, I lost track, I think it's about 170 now. And parts of it is written, is written for system administrators and part of it was written by our, our, uh, our marketing people. And you know, uh, uh, this is probably easier for you to, uh, to read through. Uh, it's even better if your institution uh, is motivated to make some efforts to help the researchers work in the cloud. Uh, what I'm showing you here, uh, to those of you that have been on the Amazon website, this probably looks like an Amazon website to you. It has the color scheme and the layout and everything. It's actually a website uh, at uh, Emory University. It's a, a university in, in the, in the southern, southern US. Uh, what they did is they, they built a mechanism where any of their researchers can go to the Emory website, open a new AWS account for a research project, no humans need to touch it. In about eight minutes, the account is provisioned and set up and good to go. And it will tie into the university's uh, single sign-on system. It will tie into the billing and invoicing system so that your cost can be tracked and assigned to the right project. It will apply the university's compliance policies so the researchers only have access to those AWS services that the university has explicitly whitelisted. And it just takes a huge burden out of the hands of the researchers. It also has a side effect that this way, Central IT or Central HPC has an overview of what's going on in the institution. And they can manage it and they can go and provide help, help where needed. Whereas in some places it's a little bit more the Wild West researchers open accounts and nobody knows about it and, uh, and it can be a bit difficult uh, to manage things. On top of that, it's helpful if you have a, a core team, maybe out of your HPC center or out of your IT service, if you have a core team of people that are very knowledgeable about the cloud, maybe they study and get an AWS certification. I saw one person here with an uh, AWS certification t-shirt, so you must have at least one. And, um, uh, and they can serve as a trusted advisor for the other researchers on the campus. You'll go to them, you'll talk about your research project, I need to run this computational fluid dynamics code, and this is where my input data lives, and this is, you know. And they'll tell you, okay, that that's piece is well suited for the cloud, we're gonna use these services, Here's a template we've used with another research group where you can make it a little bit and then, and then use the same thing for you. The institutions that uh, create a team like that really see great success. And the people that work on those teams also tend to have, uh, enjoy their jobs and, uh, and, and have a really good time. Um, it's always a popular role to be helping researchers and you're learning great skills that uh, you know, are very relevant in, the, in tomorrow's world as well. Uh, the example here is uh, an, a DOE national lab in the US, not, not far from the uh, Amazon Seattle headquarters where, where I live. At times we also partner directly with universities. Uh, one of my projects is with the uh, uh, Berkeley RISE lab. So it's uh, uh, one of the best machine learning labs in the world, I think, uh, out of Berkeley. Uh, they're currently working on building an open source, real-time machine learning stack. So in machine learning, you usually train a model against a data set, and then you make predictions off of the model, right? Um, usually that's done in a static way. You do the training once or occasionally. Um, but people, are now, people now want sort of continuous training, where new data is added to the training set all the time, and you update the models continuously. <laughs> people also want very low latency predictions now, because you want to do things like, say, have a fleet of autonomous vehicles or drones or something like that. Um, Obviously, if you want to, vehicles making decisions about how to move on a public road where there are people, that decision needs to come back in a small fraction of a second, right? You can't wait a whole second for that prediction to come back because somebody will be dead by that time. Right? Um, and uh, there are no open source stacks to do this today, surprisingly. There are a few closed stacks, like the high frequency traders uh, built one because they have all the money in the world and they, you know, they're in a game where you can't lose money, so they did it. But uh, so Berkeley wants to build an open source stack. These are the same guys that invented Apache Spark, by the way, which I'm sure some of you have, have heard of. That was built and invented uh, on, on Amazon. 
Uh, we also work with the uh, funding agencies directly. I think the, uh, the ideal picture that we hope to see emerge over the coming years is that researchers can always choose the best tool for the job, whether that's the AWS cloud or it is some other resource. <laughs> Today, there are still some hurdles because certain processes and, and policies haven't quite caught up, and we all know the funding is kind of convoluted in research. Uh, so there are still a few kinks to iron out there, and so we're uh, talking to uh, agencies in uh, multiple countries around the world to work on that. I think there are also some conversations happening in Australia. Probably still more that could be done. And then uh, finally, we've seen a lot of fields that um, researchers don't necessarily consume HPC codes directly, but there are kind of community platforms, something like a Galaxy or the Pangeo notebook platform in, in, uh, in climate science. And uh, those platforms often sort of abstract away the infrastructure platform where the, the core cycles are actually being consumed. And where we can, we also work with those kinds of community platforms to make sure that cloud is one of the supported uh, roads that they can take. Um, the, Flying Pig apparently is the, uh, uh, the mascot of the, the Chromo platform, which is a pretty common uh, genomics platform out of the, the Broad Institute. And uh, this here is a little screenshot of uh, Pangeo, which is a, uh, a way of visualizing and working with the, the massive data sets that are coming out in, uh, in climate science these days. Uh, we see everywhere people, people just want notebooks, right? Uh, so. Something else to keep in mind. Uh, I think we're probably not going to talk about education today because you're all here for research, right? Uh, so I'm going to skip a few, oops, a few slides on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me. So uh, within education, there are a few pillars that we work with. Uh, you're obviously higher education. There's also K-12, um, edtechs, which are companies like, uh, like Blackboard or so, providing learning platforms. And then learning companies is uh, publishers like Pearson's or Wiley or uh, Elsevier or something like that. Um, within higher education, what we typically see is there are enterprise IT workloads. Many of you probably don't have to work with directly, but it's about backing up data, processing student applications, the library systems, and, and all those kind of things. Uh, Within those IT operations, the, the goal for coming to the cloud is usually rationalizing and saving money. It's usually pretty simple. Um, then there is research. We already talked about that, about the cost of the research business come to the cloud. And then within the education pillar, it's typically um, some universities move their education platforms to the cloud to save money, but the biggest selling point is really improving student access. So what we often see on campuses is there are computer labs, and if you're going to learn, if you're going to teach your student data science skills, they have to go to these, to these computer labs, they have to sign up, access is restricted. Some students have a powerful new Mac where they can learn certain things at home. Poor students don't have that and they fall behind because they don't really have the same access to resources. And so when you move a lot of that stuff into the cloud and you basically provide people with virtual workstations, or virtual desktops, or if you uh, just completely stream out your applications and just bring the pixels to whatever device they might have, it becomes easier for students to spend more time interacting with learning platforms and learning resources. And so our most important success stories are from universities where they find that students spend three or four times more time learning, say, data science skills or ML skills or what have you, because the virtual, uh, virtual desktops are always there for them to use. Um, in Amazon Services, it's called uh, Amazon Workspaces, and it's, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not a specialist in it, but it's uh, being rolled out across a lot of institutions, at least in the U.S. where I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the landscape. Um, what we also see is a lot of schools, like we have these, um, uh, let's say, student innovation centers where students will work on projects, uh, learn a bit of agile development, interact with technology, maybe even get set up to go do an internship or work with a, a, a large uh, industry partner. Um, some of these centers are like ordering Alexas and Amazon Echoes by, uh, by the box and uh, getting their students to program against these things. And uh, uh, that's another uh, popular thing we see in, uh, in, in education. 